So, Dario, um, inequality of overconsumption. Why should we care? Well, so far, uh, inequality has risen up the uh, global agenda. Uh, the fact that there's the richest 1% after the financial crisis is you not know, the headlines, people are a lot more aware of it. On the other hand, uh, levels of consumption at the moment are unsustainable. We have the indicators, whether it's climate change or uh, species going extinct at an alarming rate. So we know we need to deal with these challenges. But what isn't talked about as much is dealing with them at the same time. So just to give you some examples of why we need to do that. So if governments were to take action to reduce inequality, uh, say by uh, taxing the rich uh, more to redistribute wealth, what would that mean uh, for people's consumption? Would they consume more? Would they take more flights, for example, increase their carbon footprint? On the other hand, uh, if governments were to try and tackle overconsumption, so to uh, try and make consumption more sustainable and uh, within um, the, the uh, amount that we need to get down to, to have a planet that we can all live on, um, how is inequality factored into that? For example, if they were to impose a carbon tax so to make it more expensive uh, for you to uh, get your petrol into your car and then burn those fossil fuels, uh, the richest can afford to do that. The question is, would they be able to afford that indefinitely because their wealth is increasing faster than the rate of growth, as shown by Thomas Piketty. So the richest are not affected in the same way as everyone else. So that's why inequality and overconsumption need to be dealt with together and because uh, people need to be targeted differently. The rich and the, the middle classes and the working class need to be targeted differently. So I suppose there's, uh, there is an increasing movement in economics and in policy to financialise the entire system, put value on ecosystems, value on carbon emissions, uh, value on different parts of the environment. Um, is there a risk then that uh, the, these high um, net worth individuals, so the wealthier, can afford to damage the planet uh, or exploit particular natural resources, whereas the rest of us can't afford to do that? So it, it, could this inequality become an inequality of exploitation as well as just a wealth inequality? Uh, yeah, so I mean, so, so far we don't know what the ecological footprint of productive investments are, so investments in a coal mine or in drilling for oil, but probably a lot of those uh, investments and assets are held by the richest, um, and that's where a lot of, they derive a lot of their wealth from. So in a way, uh, the richest are the ones who are really benefiting the most from uh, over-exploiting uh, the, the Earth's natural resources, and so conceivably that could continue. So just in thinking about some of the solutions then and some of the things you could do, um, in the past we've had levels of um, ultra wealthy and individuals who've been ultra wealthy um, and we've seen them invest in the future, so you know, Henry Ford and, and great names of industrial endeavour. Um, we see some of those, and you mentioned Gates as one of the people who does invest some of the wealth in some of these solutions. Um, and there are others um, that do that. Um, is there a, a class of high net worth individuals who try and solve some of these problems and, and some others that don't? So can we just rely on those individuals to do the right thing or do you think we do need to do something more dramatic and in, intervening? So if we just take the example of Bill Gates, he's an interesting case of the benefit of relying on uh, the richest to do the right thing and also not. So he has said that he will invest billions in uh, renewable energy, but at the same time he still has a lot of investments in fossil fuels. So yes, we can rely on the richest to do the right thing and to, they are, a lot of them are aware of climate change and the, the ecological crisis and need to action and some of them are, but we can't just rely on them to do it voluntarily. And so far, a lot of policies, for example, that aim to uh, provide information on how to make your consumption more sustainable, they rely on individuals to voluntarily take action. And I really believe at this stage, uh, given the gravity of what we're facing of uh, dangerous climate change and the species are going extinct at such a fast rate, I think it is dangerous to rely on the richest to voluntarily take action. It's, it's time for governments to, to step in and to ensure that uh, people take action, so that, including the richest, uh, so that we stay within uh, the planetary boundaries. And you, you're talking about tackling, or the need to tackle both inequality and consumption at the same time. And the last time um, the governments tackled inequality and consumption and brought them both down significantly, 
that was the Second World War, and prior to that was the First World War, so inequality was about the level it is now, um, and consumption was on an upward trajectory, then, they, then both came down. Do you think it's possible to do this without that global urgency or without the, the, the additional um, impetus that a war gives us? Uh, well, so part of the problem which will sound obvious is that we need to reduce inequality because it's so extreme and that, that has to happen, but part of the reason why that's a problem for then trying to take global action or in countries to reduce uh, ecological footprints is that the richest, whether it's their willingness to pay and therefore uh, judging what should happen by how much people spend and the richest have the most money so that would, they would then be able to dominate what happens in a society, or whether it's the fact that they just have uh, more money so that uh, for example, if a carbon tax is imposed, they're more likely to be able to get by. Uh, we're, we're, we're at a point where uh, extreme inequality is actually hurting the chances of countries, uh, whether it's at the national level or even within uh, different sectors of, sectors of the population to take action. It's actually undermining that because uh, the richest uh, effectively can be considered to live in a kind of bubble where uh, they can, on the one hand, ignore uh, the ecological crisis, so whether that's they suffer less from air pollution, for example, but on the other hand, um, they also have more resources when they are affected. So, for example, when Superstorm Sandy hit uh, the eastern coast of the United States uh, in 2012, uh, the richest, of course, were affected as well as the poorest, but uh, they got their, uh, they got their. Uh, houses and electricity back uh, a lot quicker than the poorest but also what's interesting is uh, what happened afterwards. Uh, there's no data to confirm who actually bought backup generators but after Superstorm Stanley there was a spike in uh, purchase of these backup generators uh, which the best ones cost around $10,000 to give you an idea and that would mean that if another hurricane uh, was to arrive uh, those people who had those backup generators would be uh, able to not to completely ignore the fact that, that, that the hurricane happened and their house might be damaged, but to survive uh, better and to well to continue to have access to electricity so to, to a mobile phone, for example, which is crucial at a time of a national disaster. I mean, I think because there are some um, within the emergency services or infrastructure providers looking at something like Supersol and Sandy, who who may argue that. Um, Actually, part of the reason that you, um, it's not the reason, but part of this response by people uh, after a crisis like that to rebuild infrastructure, you need this stratification across society where some people are able to afford to repair quickly and others it takes longer because we don't have enough engineers, we don't have enough skilled labour force to be able to do all the repairs if we were, um, if we had to respond all together. So the, the wealth stratification is, is just a one way of prioritising our responses. Um, I don't know whether it's the appropriate way of prioritising our responses, but that certainly seems to be the way we, we prioritise at the moment. The people who are insured can re instantly respond, and those who don't, as in uh, New Orleans, takes years, if not decades, to respond. I don't know if you've got any final comments on, on some of that sort of, you know, the wealth is our priority to respond at the moment. Uh, yes, I mean, so uh, when there is a disaster, um, of course, uh, it's, it's the best situation for people to be able to recover as quickly as possible. But it shouldn't be that only the richest or the uh, middle class say, are the only ones who are able to do that. Um, so to give you uh, another example of the importance of uh, linking inequality and uh, uh, consumption is when Superstorm Standy hit um, New York area, um, a lot of the uh, toxic um, landfills and uh, chemical facilities which are based in poorer neighbourhoods, uh, those uh, chemicals etc, they, uh, due to the floodwaters, they spread into those poorer areas. So it was a, uh, a kind of um, warning, a, a kind of um, uh, to highlight the fact that the poorest were living in those areas where uh, they were more likely to suffer from environmental injustice, environmental pollution, and then when the disaster hit, not only did they not have more resources to recover, but they were also hit by this, uh, also by the fact that they were located near to these toxic land sites. And the richest are just not in that situation, and ultimately that's not fair, but it's also it's not sustainable in the long term when more uh, disasters are probably on their way uh, due because of climate change. Thanks.